There are a lot of issues surrounding Marcellus fracking, health issues, safety issues, environmental issues, land issues, and money issues. I'm Dan Ringer, and we'll talk about fracking and take your calls live on the air right now on this special hour-long The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. As with most things, there are both benefits and problems associated with Marcellus Shale fracking. Tonight, our experts will take your calls live on air. The number to call is 1-800-375-4049, 800-375-4049. Our expert guests are Professor Michael McCauley of the West Virginia University Department of Occupational and Environmental Health Sciences and West Virginia University College of Law professors Patrick C. McGinley and Joshua Fershea. Gentlemen, thank you for coming in. Pleasure. We talk about fracking, and there's, I think there's some confusion because we talk about Marcellus gas, and then we're talking about oil and gas, and we've already been through one oil and gas boom in West Virginia about 100 years ago. How is this boom, Marcellus fracking, different from just ordinary oil and gas production? Well, what's happening here is uh, they've combined several processes that have been around for a while. Uh, the first one is horizontal drilling. Uh, normally, uh, a conventional gas well would have a vertical shaft running down to the layer where the gas is. Uh, in horizontal drilling, you drill first the, har the horizontal well, or the uh, vertical well, and then you drill out horizontally from that, which allows you to move out further without having to sink another well. Um, then along with that, there is hydraulic fracturing. So once the horizontal well is drilled, uh, you go out and with uh, pressurized, in this case, water, although it could be pressurized almost anything, including gas, uh, but with pressurized water, you fracture the shale. It's like breaking a blackboard, so you have all of these fractures. And behind that, you put in a propent to allow gas to flow back up. And then you pull the water and the propent back, sorry, and some of the propent back out, and then allow the gas to flow. Conventional wells, it's just one place. You can drill out horizontally from this vertical shaft in multiple directions as well. So it makes it a little more efficient. Uh, and the uh, Marcellus shale is a very rich uh, gas source. Uh, and so when we get down into the Marcellus, uh, we're looking at higher pressures. Uh, folks doing the drilling around here say they're getting as much out of one well here in West Virginia as they get out of 50 wells in Louisiana. Shale wells. Shale wells. They have to go down really, really deep. The Marcellus shale is... How, how far below the surface? 5,000 to 7,000 feet. Uh, and there are uh, layers even below that. The Utica Shale, for example, sits below the Marcellus and underlies much of the Marcellus. Um, the Marcellus runs mostly through New York, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Uh, the Utica, however, will run over some of the same area as well as into Ohio. So if you're in Ohio, the, you're looking at an even deeper shale 
And, the, and Marcellus and Utica are not the only shales in the country. They're no, they're spread not. Around. There are lots of shale deposits. Uh, the Barnett Shale in Texas, for example, uh, that produces a lot of gas as well. So, our energy future is good. Looking at these shales, the industry says we have quite a bit of gas in these deposits. Uh, so yes, the uh, the energy outlook is is quite good. I was just at a conference where they were talking about uh, the future, uh, potential future for West Virginia with with natural gas production. Uh, as long as uh, as you can use the gas in the state, they were saying, uh, then um, you might derive a lot greater benefit uh, rather than simply extracting it and piping it somewhere else. I'm, I don't understand that. As long as you can use it in the state, why would that be a higher benefit? Uh, because you then get uh, things like uh, manufacturing to go along with it. So we have an energy source here in the state that we can use in the state uh, to benefit more products. So it's a value added proposition. Well, and that's what happened in the first gas boom. We attracted all kinds of industries, the chemical industry in the Kanawha Valley, glass industry uh, in the Wheeling area, Morgantown area, Lewis County area, and many other places in the state because gas was plentiful and it was inexpensive because it was here. Exactly right. Uh, and of course, uh, the gas can be used to make plastics. Uh, so you can also supply a chemical industry. Well, as, as happened in the Kanawha River Valley. Exactly. And we had coal. And the two together uh, really generated uh, amazing industry. Pittsburgh, steel, wheeling, steel, you had oil and gas and coal. Did we really utilize the coal in West Virginia or did we ship it out? Well, the, we, we did use it in West Virginia. The steel mills on the Ohio and uh, uh, wheeling in the uh, northern panhandle especially. And, and, and for other processes as well, coal uh, was used to make chemicals as well. And that's, you have uh, Institute West Virginia and the chemical uh, corridor there in the Kanawha River Valley as well. So gas and, and coal contributed to uh, the economy of West Virginia. We have our first caller, Mike from Wood County. Mike, do you have a comment or question for us? Yes, my comment or my uh, question is on the horizontal drilling process. And is there compensation for the adjacent landowners where the ver vertical shaft goes down and they start fracking? Or is that just the individual property that they start to shaft on? The, the property, uh, it would be a trespass for somebody to drill onto uh, or under somebody else's land. And so the, the location of where the gas is, um, is who the owner of it is. There are some open questions. Texas actually had a case that suggested the rule of capture, which is if you go down and get it, it's yours, uh, applied in hydraulic fracturing. Uh, West Virginia uh, overruled that, although the case was settled and, and vacated in the, uh, last year. But the expectation, I think, from, from most of us looking at this would be that if somebody goes, uh, drills a well on one piece of land and, and takes a left turn onto somebody else's, uh, that would be a trespasser they'd have to compensate uh, for whoever mineral rights that is. That said, it's whoever owns the mineral rights, not the surface owner, who would necessarily get that. So if it's a split estate, meaning that the surface owner doesn't own the mineral rights, somebody else would get paid for going onto that land, but it wouldn't be the surface owner. In general terms, what happens in West Virginia is the company that wants to produce the oil and gas, mostly gas, I guess, is what we're producing here, buys the mineral rights or leases the mineral rights on a particular tract of land where they're going to locate their well, and then they also lease them on all of the tracks around that that they're going to be drilling under, and then they perform their fracking operation and start pulling the oil and gas out. So I guess, Mike, the answer to your question is a little bit of both. Uh, you've got, they call them estates and land, as uh, Josh referenced. Uh, they will come to the person who owns the oil and gas rights, acquire the right to produce those minerals, and the surface owner may or may not have anything to do with it. Well, it's a little more tricky than that. There are currently 55,000 active uh, wells in, in West Virginia, and uh, there are leases that are so active that were originally uh, signed 50, 80, 100 years ago. So. Uh, those leases may play a role in uh, who has the right to the shale gas. It is not easy 
sometimes to identify the ownership of any particular mineral. And in some of those original uh, deeds of severance where somebody came along and gave you a $5 bill and a handshake, they would take all of the minerals, which would include anything that wasn't just flat dirt and maybe the dirt too if there was something in it that they could get out. Yes, that, uh, that's right. Uh, uh, one thing I would say to those who are uh, watching and listening is uh, if you're in a situation where somebody comes to you and wants to lease uh, Marcellus uh, shale gas, go to a lawyer. Oh my, yes. It's absolutely essential. And there are a lot of land agents um, who uh, do the work for uh, companies who may not be, even be interested in, in extracting the gas. They will sell those rights. They are not your friend. They may be friendly. They are not your friend. They want to lease the gas at the lowest possible rate of royalty that you receive. And uh, uh, you just, you, you will get the lowest royalty possible if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't talk to a lawyer and retain a lawyer. There's a lot of money involved here and it's important to, to do it right. And in fact, the, the West Virginia uh, uh, Surface Owners Association, they have a website and I can't remember exactly what it is, but they have a list of lawyers who are uh, willing to be referred these sorts of cases. Don't do it yourself. I think that's a the It basic is impossible word. to read an oil and gas lease and understand what is being said in it. I remember the first one that was presented to me, it took me many, many days to parse it, to look up each and every term and develop a working understanding of it. I've been practicing long enough that there was no such thing as Marcel's Shale when I started and now I feel like I know something about it, but boy, it's, you can't depend on your next door neighbor. Well, one other thing I would recommend, uh, I've heard rumors of people going to attorneys and not doing it for a fee, but looking for a percentage of the oil and gas lease. If a lawyer asks for a percentage of the oil and gas lease, find another one. Do it as a fee for service, not as a percentage of what you're doing. And it, it can be fairly expensive to get good advice about an oil and gas lease. And when I say fairly expensive, I mean a few hundred dollars. Uh, but that's part of the cost of doing that kind of business because you want to understand what it is. You should get a letter that explains the lease to you in terms that you can understand and an opportunity to ask questions about it. If you do not get those things, go to somebody who will give you those things. Now, I would say always go to a lawyer. And one thing that's important for everyone who's watching to, to understand is that the only thing that counts is what's in the lease. Whatever the land agent or a company lawyer tells you doesn't matter. The, the only enforceable provisions, the only rights you have are in that written lease. And sometimes you'll be told, yes, we have to build an access road to get to where we want to drill, and we'll put that over on the edge of your property so that it doesn't bother you. Unless it's in the lease, it means nothing. There are rules in law, rules of interpretation, rules of how things are to be uh, constructed and understood. And basically it says, if it's not in writing on the four corners of the document, it's not an enforceable provision, no matter what you've been told. Unless it rises to the level of fraud and then to apply it, you would have to have a major lawsuit and you don't want to have to do that. We have another caller, Emily, also in Wood County. Emily, do you have a comment or question for us? Yes, thank you. Um, good topic. Um, the question I have, I hope it's applicable, but I was really wanting to know if approximately how much of the gas that we have been extracting through this Marcellus Shell over the last 10 years or so, and currently or at any point, how much of that is actually being sold overseas and how much of this is being used to offset um, the coal, you know, the output, the, you know, the, the whole thing of the gas is going to have less CO2 output. Okay. So are we replacing coal with Marcellus gas? And are we selling mm -hmm. it overseas? We're not selling it overseas. It's currently illegal uh, to ship. There are some, uh, recently we've cited some liquid, liquefied natural gas terminals or LNG terminals that uh, would be able to ship overseas, but so far we haven't done uh, any sales of gas overseas. Um, in terms of replacing 
coal, absolutely. Natural gas is with low prices as it is right now. Nothing displaces coal, uh, coal faster than cheap gas. I, I, I would add, though, that coal isn't going to be totally displaced by natural gas. Coal is going to be around for decades. But in terms of the market share that, that coal has, the entire energy market, it has already lost a significant amount of market share, but it's not going to drop to zero. It's about 35 percent now, was 50 percent. Uh, shale gas has not been around for 10 years, and we're talking the last four or five years when you've had any kind of significant uh, production. But uh, uh, coal will continue to be mined in West Virginia, and of course, uh, uh, shale gas promises jobs and manufacturing. Uh, it's a really a boon if done right. I suppose the question becomes, with an abundance of gas through Marcellus Gas and otherwise, the advance of solar and wind energies, why is coal going to stay around? Why not just replace it? Well, there, there are facilities that, that burn coal that it's not economical uh, to replace. It, 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 there are certain types of uh, uh, facilities where uh, it, it's more practical to use coal. Uh, coal is close to uh, power plants. Uh, it depends on, uh, really depends substantially on the market. There are also long-term uh, contracts that uh, have been entered into to supply coal for, for decades going forward. So uh, uh, coal is going to be around and it's, uh, the, the, the challenge is to burn coal cleanly, to mine it uh, without damaging the, the environment. And that's the same thing with Marcellus. Uh, if, you, if we're going to have it, then it should be extracted in a way that doesn't harm people, doesn't uh, harm communities or the environment. But every form of energy production has drawbacks. Every form has. Um, if you look at solar panels, for example, you'd think, well, what could be cleaner than a solar panel, except solar panels are made of uh, some fairly toxic materials. So you have waste from making solar panels that is toxic. And of course, solar panels can't compete with the cost of something like either coal or natural gas. And in fact, coal is very competitive from a cost standpoint. Uh, at least here in the state of West Virginia. When you start getting into shipping things, then the costs change slightly. Um, but um, here where we're producing the coal and we're making energy from it, uh, coal is still very competitive. Uh, wind power, people uh, speak of the problems with birds and bats in the area, and it uh, disrupts the ecosystem where they are. Well, I even read a, a news article uh, with regard to solar panel electrical production in the far west, uh, apparently the panels were being aimed at, uh, I'll call them, uh, at a mirror or a condenser, and they were essentially vaporizing birds that flew through the uh, beam of light. Right, uh, these, these are mirrored panels uh, that are reflecting uh, the sunlight onto a central collector, and of course, it's just like taking, almost like taking a magnifying glass to a bug in, in the grass and uh, magnifying the light from the sun onto that spot. That's essentially what it's doing. And, you know, it can vaporize something that flies through. Well, so there are problems with essentially everything. We've got another call. Paul in Harrison County. Paul, do you have a comment or question for us? Yes, thank you. Um, my uh, farm, I have about a 100 acre farm and uh, Marcellus Well was drilled recently about 200 yards from our property line. Uh, and I was curious as to how close the property line can it be drilled and how can you verify that a horizontal spike has not been uh, drilled out underneath your property, either intentionally or unintentionally. What are the setback requirements on a, a well? Well, as, the two, uh, as far as I know, it's 200 feet from a, from a home or a, a water well. Actually, that's, that was changed because we just with the new did a statute. Study. Yeah, with the new statute, it's 625 feet. Uh, from a sensitive location, so that would be a home, for example, or a business or a school, something like that. That's right. Is there any requirement regarding setbacks from property lines? Not that I know of from property I, lines. I don't know of any. And how do you verify that you're not being drilled under? That would assume that you own the mineral rights beneath the surface, because if you don't own the mineral rights uh, under the property that you own the surface of, you might not get any real notice of the, of the horizontal drilling at all, would you? 
uh, I've heard of a few cases where people have been able to ascertain uh, that someone was drilling underneath their property. I would suspect it's probably with seismic uh, charting and you'd have to speak to a geologist about that. Well, I think the permit uh, applications ought to indicate. They that. certainly should, and as long as they abide by the permit application. And uh, that's a real question, because when we're, we're talking about Marcellus Shale, we're talking about billions of dollars. And uh, as in any industry, you're going to find people who cut corners, who take advantage of those who don't have adequate information. So the, for the caller, uh, it makes some sense to uh, to talk to an attorney, I guess uh, there is information available online through the uh, West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection about various permits. Uh, that's a little challenging for the uninitiated, but uh, I think that information is available and it's worth checking out. And uh, it's worth noting uh, DEP recently hired uh, two landowner advocates. So for people that have questions, they can try and track down those landowner advocates who can uh, help in that process in finding the permits and um, finding out what's going on in their region. They at least try to help connect uh, landowners and others with what's going on in their area. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the program. Don't go it alone. There, there are experts out there who can help you, and you need to acquire their help. That's right. And uh, just following up on what Josh said, uh, I think you can find the information, the contact online on the DP's website. We're talking about issues of Marcellus fracking and taking your calls. The number to call is 1-800-375-4049. My, my guests are Professor Michael McCauley of the West Virginia University Department of Occupational and Environmental Health Sciences and West Virginia University College of Law Professors Patrick C. McGinley and Joshua Fouché. I'm Dan Ringer and this is The Law Works. What are the problems with these Marcellus wells? Uh, if I own a piece of property and 625 feet away from me somebody is getting ready to put in a Marcellus well, what should I expect? Mm. Well, you can certainly expect noise to begin with. Uh, a lot of times light intrusions uh, because they will uh, drill 24 hours a day in, in many cases. Uh, and then there are a number of air emissions. We did a study at West Virginia University for the Department of Environmental Protection actually um, under the uh, aegis of the, the West Virginia legislature. And uh, we looked at what you could find 625 feet back. Now, when you say a setback is 625 feet, uh, in West Virginia, that's measured from the center of the well pad. Not everything that's emitted into the air is emitted from the center of the well pad, nor does all of the noise come from the center of the well pad. And the center of the well, the well pad itself is not the size of this tabletop. No, it's several acres in size uh, for um, the, the kind of standard three, somewhere between three and nine acres, I believe. Is, is what they talk about. And so um, in, in some states, in Pennsylvania, I believe, they measure the setback distance from the edges of the well pad. Uh, but even that is uh, not where everything occurs. Uh, we were at 625 feet at one well pad, and they put a flare right next to our uh, samplers. So they were flaring 625 feet away. Now the house was in the opposite direction, so they, they were not near any uh, dwellings, but they were at 625. And the flare is, is not what people might uh, generally think of. That's a substantial amount of gas being burned off, and it has uh, emissions that can be uh, uh, harmful. Yeah, the highest emissions we found in that report uh, we found next to that flare in that particular case. And the emissions that we found were benzene. Uh, so and the, benzene is a carcinogen, right. in, in case you don't know. I had someone approach me who said, I have a, a small farm. I've been approached uh, by somebody who wants to lease the gas under it, and they want to drill on my property, a uh, Marcellus well. And I said, how much property do you own? And he said, 15 acres. <laughs> And I said, where do you live? And he said, I live on the property. I said, my suggestion is you cannot do that, not and live there, because the, the use with the drilling going on, even if they don't have a compressing station there, just the wellhead would be so intrusive that 
the value of your property as a residential property is essentially zero. Well, it is. It's interesting that actually one of the sites that we looked at uh, in our study, um, you could walk out the person's back door and just about be on the well pad. Uh, but he was making a lot of money from it because he owned the oil and gas rights and the mineral rights still. Um, and it didn't bother him at all because it sounded like money. <laughs> well, well it, it might bother him later if his health is uh, impaired yeah, or when he, yeah. and he wants to sell his house and move on somewhere else and nobody else wants to buy it. Yeah. But it's, it's true and, and I hear trains go by where I live from time to time and these tend to be trains full of coal and when I hear them, if it bothers me, I think the same thing. It's the sound of money running up that train line and that's a good thing. So I, I try to put up with that. We have another call. Lindy up from Doddridge County. Do you have a comment or a question for us? Uh, yes. Uh, my comment and question would be uh, that why aren't they talking about the fact that there are toxic chemicals placed in that water that's used for fracking and that only 60% of that water comes back again, that they take over 3 million gallons of water to do one well? and that the, the drill cuttings are loaded with radiation. So th these are things that concern people. Uh, this happens all over my county. Yeah, and that's Doddridge County, and Lindia in uh, Marshall and Ohio counties, they're using uh, 10 million gallons of water uh, to do a well and 13 million pounds of sand. Right, um, it, it takes a lot of water and it takes a lot of sand to do this. And uh, you, you have to understand though that uh, the water, a lot of the water is recycled. Some of it does come back up, even though some of it stays in the ground. Um, and the, what comes back up actually ends up being used in the next well and the next well and the next well. So they are recycling it. Uh, but it's not just water that comes back up. Oh no, uh, there's water and there are a lot of petroleum products because um, a, a shale deposit like that will have all sorts of petroleum uh, materials, some of which are in fact highly toxic. Um, now it's, it, if everything is done exactly according to Hoyle and the way it's supposed to be and there are no leaks in uh, any of the casings, then it, it goes into a tank and it gets taken away well, uh, to the next site. Right. But eventually, something has to be done with it. Um, I'm familiar with a uh, deep well where they were injecting the fluid after it had been used to the point where it couldn't be used in the fracking process anymore. And uh, there were a lot of concerns about putting it back in the ground and would it leak getting in, back into that deep well. Uh, so it's, it's not entirely a troubleless. No, there, there, there are real concerns about it. And you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. McCauley, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the foreign constituents of fracking water, other than water, is about one and a half percent. That's right. In a five million gallon uh, fracking job, that would be a hundred tons of material. It would be the sand plus uh, chemicals, and at some point that has to be disposed of. And that's a real question. I know Josh has been doing some work and writing uh, about that particular problem. Well, the chemicals that go in as it's being injected in the well include sodium chloride, ethylene glycol, borate salt, sodium potassium carbonate, guar gum, isopropanol, and secret stuff that are considered to be trade secrets, and nobody except the people who mix it knows really what that is. Right, uh, and don't forget the radiation that may come back up as that comes, well. Well, the stuff that comes back up is not the stuff that goes down. Right, and um, the radiation, I, I was just talking to some folks in Pennsylvania and they were saying, well, the cuttings that we've got coming up, we're putting those on a train and we're filling up train loads full of this, some of which is radioactive. Uh, well, trains and, are completely safe. We don't have any problems. Uh, and it's going to a hazardous waste incinerator Guess where the hazardous waste incinerator is? East Liverpool, Ohio, which is right across the Ohio River. Well, it sits on the Ohio River and is right across from Chester, West Virginia. The very tip of the northern panhandle. That's so right. can uh, radioactive material be incinerated? Um, uh, as long as it's below a particular level. And West Virginia actually has one of the lowest ratings for 
uh, for radioactive material and how they test that, and that's one of the things that's um, going to be brought before the legislature and regulators trying to raise that. Um, I've heard a number of things about that. One of the things to keep in mind, though, is that uh, actually only about 20% of the water comes back as flowback water. It's still a lot of water and it has to be dealt with. Uh, and one of the big problems that we saw over time was uh, when they initially started this, they weren't recycling. They were doing impoundment pits, they were, and, and some of them extremely sloppy. Some um, of it was being dumped in streams, too. And, and those, were the, those risks are, are very, very real, as are the other ones. But, but the initial part of this was a real, real problem, and they've gotten better in part because the economics of doing recycling have gotten better. And because the public was outraged when, when they were cavalier about it. Well, do we have to worry about the water, the fracking fluid, that doesn't come back up? At 5,000 feet, 7,000 feet below, you're not going to see that water uh, intruding into groundwater systems. That the groundwater systems are above 1,000 feet for the most part. So it's, it's not going to make it very far. The frack itself, the actual fracturing, uh, goes about 500 feet on average. Uh, and so you're not going to fracture up into the groundwater. Uh, yeah. However, if it leaks, when you're drawing it back, that's, that's one of the last steps, flow back. So when you're pulling the stuff back out, uh, if there are cracks in the casing, in the, in the cement that surrounds the casing, uh, then in fact you could get all sorts of things going into groundwater. That's very difficult to clean up. And, the, and those casing failures, in, in fact, uh, there have been many research projects on this, have found that the real problem with fracking is not what happens to the, to, with the liquids at five or 7,000 feet or whatever, it's the liquids going down and coming back up. That's right. There was a Duke University study just published this past week, in fact, that pretty much confirmed that that was really happening. They had. But those failures can be caused by improper design, improper construction, geologic events, and we're hearing more and more and more about Earth. I'm calling them earthquakes. I don't know what the technical term would be associated, they believe, with Marcellus drilling. It wouldn't take much of that to crack a well, uh, a well would it? Well, what happens uh, with the earthquakes now? First of all, when you go and do the deep injection wells, uh, that's, those are the, the operations that have really been associated with the earthquakes in, in Ohio and Oklahoma. Uh, more so than the fracking operations. Uh, but it's, it's part of the whole story of the gas production. Uh, but yes, any, anything that goes on in the earth that causes a tremor can crack that casing. And it's, they say in the industry, in, in sessions I've been in, that, that putting the cement around this casing is more an art than a science. And if you've ever poured concrete, you can be fairly familiar with, you know, keeping it crack free. There's another complicating factor, uh, Dr. McCauley, maybe you can uh, speak about, and that's the number of abandoned old oil and gas wells in Pennsylvania and West Virginia that, uh, at least what I've read, uh, uh, there are concerns about that, uh, especially when the casing is cracked. That's, yeah, that's right. Just conventional oil and, right. and gas wells uh, have a casing uh, that, get sealed and can wear out over time. Uh, things can rust, things can decay, uh, things can crack, and you can get um, groundwater being corrupted that kind of way. Um, it, it's important to remember too, and I, I think most people don't realize this, in the, in the gas industry um, you're dealing with uh, at any given site a number of subcontractors. So. If you're Acme Energy Company, uh, there may only be one Acme Energy employee at the site. Everybody else is subcontractors. Um, if you've got a good subcontractor, you'll probably get a good job. There are engineers who know what they're doing. I, um, I taught in the engineering school for a long time, and I've run into an occasional graduate that I've uh, known uh, as a teacher. And I think they can do a good job of things, but if you get somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, if they're a fly-by-night operator, or if they're just simply new to the process, um, they can make mistakes, and, and they'll be more prone to that. So it's, it's difficult to say, is this a good company, is this a bad company, when you're just looking at the overall energy company. And, th and that's where enforcement comes in, and that's a real concern, not only in West Virginia, 
but in most of the uh, uh, states where shale gas is being uh, extracted. In West Virginia, I think we have 22 inspectors uh, as a result of the, that, that double the amount, maybe it's less than that, uh, that formerly uh, were in, out in the oil and gas fields. And they got 55,000 active wells to inspect. And, and the, if the important part of uh, extracting shale gas is the casing the well, an inspector should be there and it takes a while, and if you only have 22 to go around, uh, that's a real problem, because otherwise uh, there's no uh, uh, fail-safe check on the, on the process. It, I assume it, the same process happens with regard to oil and gas as happens with regard to coal. An inspector comes in, learns the job, gets good at the job, and gets hired away by industry. Absolutely. And you have to replace the inspector. Now, there, there's uh, been quite a few articles written about the competition of industry. The, the, the maximum amount a new uh, inspector in West Virginia can make is $35,000 and $40,000 for a supervisor. And, and the, a, uh, uh, a drill rig supervisor uh, in industry will make $80,000 or more. So the, the more experience the inspector has, the quicker they're going to be gone. Uh, to industry, and and that's a that's a real problem, and it's not only in West Virginia. Let's let's take another call, Don in Ritchie County. Do you have a comment or question for us? Yes, I've heard that there's a five percent uh, severance tax on the production of natural gas, um, but I've also heard I've talked to our county commission, and they said they haven't seen any money, and there's a two-year time lag from the time they begin production, uh, and nobody seems to know what that's all about. I'm not a tax man. <laughs> Real estate taxes in West Virginia, as we said with regard to something else, is both uh, an art and a science, and there are lags in it. It turns out that property interests in West Virginia are assessed on July 1st of each year and collected beginning September 1st of the following year, not the year in which the assessment was made. So it can happen that some of these extraction industries can purchase a mineral interest, oil and gas, coal, or whatever, have it assessed in their name, and be done with the mining project before the taxes are actually billed out and assessed and be gone. And then they'd let the remainder go to the state of West Virginia for non-payment of taxes, and nobody ever collects a nickel. So. Regulation, inspection, monitoring is all a part of this. I think an, uh, another important point is that, uh, as I was saying before, that we're talking about billions and billions of dollars, and West Virginians should get some of that back. Uh, uh, well, in well, Pennsylvania, there is no extraction that's, tax. That's right, and, and Governor Corbett is uh, running a, a difficult race for re-election uh, because there's no tax on the, the incredible... Uh, bounty of, uh, uh, that, that's been produced by shale gas in Pennsylvania thus far. Well, and the West Virginia legislature did a trip out to North Dakota to learn about their legacy fund, which is uh, a fund that takes a certain percentage of the oil and gas revenues that they have in the state uh, for long-term planning. Um, but the big difference there is that oil and gas uh, severance taxes run about 11 percent in North Dakota, uh, and they're also pulling oil out of the ground, and the margin uh, for oil is a lot higher than the margin for gas. And that's one of the other risks that I think that we see here of how do we plan for the future. Uh, and the uh, incentive or, or lack of incentive uh, to avoid harm when your margins are very, very tight with gas uh, being charged at uh, 3 to $4 an MCF when most of these leases were done in 2009 at you know, eight, nine dollars uh, is a real challenge. And that's one of the big parts where enforcement becomes so critical. And we could use some new laws to, to get better at what we're doing. But if we're not enforcing the existing laws, we're just asking for trouble. And that is about well casings. That's about site inspection, impoundment site inspections, making sure that the water is going where they say it's going to. Uh, and until we get the enforcement under control, new laws and regulations don't do a whole lot. Well, we have another caller on the line. We have Debbie in Raleigh County. Debbie, do you have a comment or question for us? Yes, I have a question. I'd like to know why they're closing coal mines down when they're building a electrical company, or electrical plant in New Jersey that can burn coal cleanly by returning it to the earth about one mile down, the CO2. Well, clean coal technology, um, 
has been something that uh, the federal government has underwritten for a while. Um, a lot of the funding that I've gotten actually to study uh, Marcella Shale has come from the Department of Energy. And it was the Department of Energy that has really been uh, focused on promoting clean coal. And carbon capture, and which carbon is what she capture. was describing, exactly. is, is a big part of that. Exactly. And, uh, and it works quite well. It actually works a little bit better for natural gas, as it turns out. Um, but the question really becomes, where do you get the coal from and how expensive is it to get the coal? And how does that compare to the natural gas? So um, it's going to depend upon who they have their contracts with and what they've paid for it. And the cost of those plants are very, very expensive relative to a traditional coal plant or a natural gas plant. As and well as the, the infrastructure that's needed to transport the, the uh, SO, uh, CO2 underground. Absolutely. And, and, and that's one of the things, the lower gas prices that we're seeing is what's really driving a lot of this. It's a real challenge because when coal starts doing these, these new coal-fired plants are extremely expensive and with the low price of gas, uh, coal's having a hard time competing on the economic front. It's, it's like many other technologies. We have the technological ability to do something, but is it cost effective to do it compared to the other options? And the answer sometimes is no, it's not. And that seems to be what's happening with coal. Coal is becoming actually more expensive to mine. It's harder to mine. Uh, and there are other things that are less expensive to produce. Well, that is interesting. Uh, that back in uh, 2010, 2009, 2010, Senator Byrd and Senator Rockefeller uh, supported legislation that would have funded clean coal technology, especially uh, carbon capture and sequestration, the, the pumping of uh, air emissions from power plants underground. And uh, the opposition, uh, but President Obama supported that. The opposition uh, felt uh, like they could do better. Uh, and there were, there were subsidies. And I think that's what it takes to build infrastructure if you're going to have clean coal tech, uh, technology. There were billions and billions of dollars of subsidies that taxpayers uh, would front but then it would allow the use of uh, a coal uh, without the CO2 uh, emissions, and the, that uh, legislation was rejected. Well, that's kind of the concept of political will. If the people who have the power to cause it to happen want it to happen, it'll happen. Right. And otherwise, it doesn't. We have another caller, Marjorie in Kanawha County. Do you have a comment or question for us? Yes, I'm, I'm sure you gentlemen are aware of the movie Gasland with the gentleman um, in the movie having fire come out of his drinking water. And then I saw a story, I think it was in Texas, where fire was coming out of the water hose in the man's backyard, and, it, and fracking was thought to be the problem with both of those. And then one other question I have, is, is this industry unionized? And if so, what union um, would be there to protect the workers and, and just us? Let's take that in two parts. Let's talk about the movie Gasland first. Josh? Well, one of the interesting things is if, the ga if your water's lighting on fire, there's methane in it. The question is not whether there's methane there. The question is where did it come from? Uh, and as Dr. McCauley mentioned, the, the fracking process itself almost certainly didn't cause that. However... We, we ought to clarify one thing. It's not flames coming out of the faucet or out of the hose. It's gas coming out of the faucet or out of the hose that can be ignited. Yes, that's right. Somebody takes a lighter to their water. Uh, or if there's a methane. spark. There's, or yes. some other spark, yeah, absolutely. And, and so um, whether this really goes down to a problem that can, was true for conventional oil and gas wells. If the casing isn't done properly and it leaks, it will migrate uh, wherever it can into an aquifer and you can have that problem. There are other places where it's naturally occurring and we've seen that, that happen uh, through um, just kind of normal geological events. Um, now, if somebody drills a gas well uh, near your property and you didn't have methane in your water before, and you do now, uh, it's likely caused from the oil and gas operations. It's not the fracking part of it that's causing it. Nonetheless, the oil and gas company would be responsible well, let's for Let's be it. clear, though. Uh, we, we don't want to confuse the, the viewers. It's the operation to obtain shale gas. It's not the, the injection of the fluid into 
into the ground that produces the gas, it's the improper installation or operation of, of the drilling equipment and so forth. And, and that's exactly right. And I think one of the challenges, and, and when people don't understand that that's the operation, is that we worry about the what water that's being pumped down and the little explosions in the base of the earth. And, and it's easy to miss that the real challenge is making sure those casings are correct. Somebody needs to be there, making sure the cement is to grade. The same problem that happened in Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico was bad cement, or at least a, a significant part of it. And we've heard the same thing. Uh, in our trip to North Dakota, I did, went with uh, West Virginia University Extension Services. We did a trip to see what they were doing to see what we could learn there. And they talked about challenges of people showing up with improper uh, not to grade cement and sending them away. And one of the things that we've heard in West Virginia is after two or three trips, even if it's not to grade, some of the sites are using that cement anyway. And that's a real danger. And that was uh, with the BP oil spill, it was lack of enforcement and uh, uh, with regard to the Department of Interior, uh, they were just looking the other way and not doing their jobs. Well, B, the, yeah, the Gulf oil spill, the BP blowout, was kind of the manifestation of all of the horrors that we can think about in any kind of drilling procedure. It just happened to be underwater. Right. And the only thing that got contam contaminated was the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> well, and one, and one of the real challenges with that, is, and, and I think industry, I hope, is paying attention to that. A number of other companies uh, that were in the Gulf of Mexico said, that, hey, that was what BP did. This is not how we do business. Uh, and there are people who can corroborate that and say that's true. But that kind of disaster leads to a massive shutdown, not to mention the number of jobs lost, the damage to the environment, and those harms. And so it's really incumbent upon industry to take an interest, interest in not just themselves, but in who else is doing the work in the area, because it reflects on the entire industry when they have a few bad actors. The way the money is so attractive and it comes so fast when you get the well drilled and you start producing. And you want to get it done quickly. Uh, you want to get through with one well and get on to the next well because every time you can start up a new well, you're starting up a bank account essentially. Two wells are better than one and three are better than two. You know, my, own, my own view is there are too many MBAs in corporate management who are bean counters and they're not uh, incorporating into the calculations the, the end cost of, of failure and environmental damage and, and damage to, to property. We need some practical business people. At, at I don't the top. want to demean MBAs, what with being one and all. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's some truth to that. We have another caller, Rick in Lawrence County, Ohio. Rick, do you have a comment or question for us? Yes, I, I just think that 22 people is not enough people to inspect wells and, and uh, that needs to be an ongoing process. They need to stand there and watch them drill because if there's mistakes made, they need to know it ahead of time. They need to, uh, well, that's my comment. Thank you, Rick. Well, let's take that one step further. When there are mistakes made, then there has to be responsibility. There have to be penalties so that the, the companies themselves, if they're hiring people that aren't capable, then they ought to pay a price. Uh, that, and that's an incentive to do it right. Across all industries we have this problem. The Elk River in Kanawha County was full of God knows what it was because there weren't enough inspectors to go out and inspect the tanks. The Upper Big Branch Mine exploded, killed 29 people because there weren't enough inspectors to go into the mines to look around and do a good inspection and now we're producing Marcellus Wells that, well, we can only imagine what can happen with those because we don't have the inspectors. Penny wise and found pound foolish. We, we can't forget that this reflects the will of the people. Well, the people when, have when to be we, educated, yeah, and that's do. why we're here tonight. That's why we are, yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, we have met the enemy, and he is us in some cases. Absolutely. So. But, but the people are going to say, all I can do is complain about it and maybe go vote in an election, but this is an election cycle, and if you watch the ads on TV, the relationship between political ads on television to convince you to vote for a particular candidate and reality is purely coincidental. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, to use another saying, though, the price of uh, liberty is eternal vigilance. Well, the price of environmental liberty is eternal vigilance. Um, one of the things that we put in that report to the DEP about setback distances was that the current regulations for air emissions are really not set up with 
this kind of manufacturing in mind with mm. the Marcellus shale drilling. They're set up with um, things like big steel plants or big coke ovens, big power plants, big chemical factories that are built in one place and stay there forever and have smokestacks. Um, these things that we're looking at with Marcellus shale are not like that and we need new enforcement regulations to handle them. Not necessarily stricter ones, but different ones. Uh, the air emissions assume that everything got mixed over a broad area of air. And it didn't really matter where you put your instruments, you'd see it. Well, with a more localized phenomenon like uh, these drill sites, you can be down in the valley where there's no wind blowing, where uh, there's an inversion, the temperature inversions are um, meteorological weather phenomenon that happen that hold in the air down in the valley. So if you've ever seen fog down in a holler, that's a manifestation of an inversion. It's uh, a warm air layer above a cold air layer holding, trapping the air down in there. So it doesn't matter if you're 625 feet or even 1,000 feet if you're down in that bowl. Uh, everything stays down there and concentrates down there. That means that the regulations have to, they can't be, we, in the law we'd say black letter law, they have to be situational, they have to take the circumstances into account for each site. You might call these wells uh, point sources. Exactly, and, and one of the things that uh, I've been talking about in, in a number of environmental groups where uh, I've been asked to speak is that instead of having the kind of compliance-based regulation that we've got where you have a single monitor and you can't go above that level, that instead if you have an engineering control approach where you have a monitor to tell you what the emissions are and whether they're remaining stable so that you know you've got control over the process, you might be better off um, having at least that extra check. Would that be more enforceable as well? It would be more enforceable. In fact, it would be enforceable as control technology because the national ambient air quality standards don't cover any or most at least of the contaminants that you'll see coming from these well sites. And those are the compliance levels that we have to use. But the law does require uh, this industry to use the best available controls on the process and if part of that control is monitoring what's going on, it falls under the law, I think. Let us try to get at least one more phone call in here. Raymond in Wood County, do you have a comment or question for us? I have a question. And, uh, we lease our, our oil and gas rights or our, our mineral rights to a gas or a energy company and they, we get royalties on oil and gas. How about methane or the other things they get from those two products? Well, you get royalties on everything that's produced? Well, natural gas is methane. Yeah. yeah you, you'll get a royalty on, on, well, it depends on what the lease says exactly as where it's tested, but you'll get, a, a, you'll get paid for the price uh, of the value of what was extracted. And so that price is measured um, by a market price. And so if they split it up and, and it goes into multiple places, uh, you won't get additional royalties. It's, it's at the cost when it's extracted. But one of the things that we see with oil wells in particular is this uh, flaring of gas being burned off, that's methane. Is anybody getting a royalty for that gas that's being burned at the wellhead? Most of the time, they're supposed to after a certain amount of time. I know the North Dakota rule uh, says you can flare gas for up to a year without paying royalties and taxes. Of course, you can continue it if you apply for a waiver uh, to do that because they don't have the facilities. Um, but at some point, that is supposed to kick in uh, and their royalties are supposed to be paid. Uh, there's been some lawsuits challenging that and, and those are ongoing. Can I say something about royalties really quickly? Oh, that please we do. Should have, we should have <laughs> said before. Uh, there's a, a historically a one-eighth royalty has been offered to landowners. Uh, viewers understand that leases are negotiable. And uh, there are people getting 20%, the 12.5% is eight, one eighth. Uh, you can negotiate when uh, the land agent or the lawyer says it's non-negotiable. Don't believe them. It's not the case. Uh, 
and you, you have to, that's why you have to have a lawyer to negotiate uh, and you can get a deal. You don't have to have uh, uh, well pad on your, your property. I know landowners who have negotiated uh, leases where they've gotten uh, very good royalties plus nothing on their land. And the gentleman with the 15 acre parcel that they wanted to put a well on, I said, lease your oil and gas. Go right ahead, make some money from that. Just tell them you don't want them to drill there because there won't be anything left and of And put it in writing. Oh, yes. <laughs> and in fact, actually, you can even negotiate some of this monitoring. Yeah, absolutely. That's an excellent point. Well, gentlemen, we have come to the end of our hour. Mike McCauley, Pat McGinley, Josh Frechet, thank you very much for being with us. It's been most interesting. I wish we had more time. I wish we had another week to come back. But this is the last The Law Works program. After 15 years and 391 programs, the series ends. I want to thank you for watching and for participating. I also want to thank the hundreds and hundreds of attorneys, law professors, judicial officials, and others who have appeared as our guests. Finally, I want to thank our production crew. They are a very talented and enthusiastic group, and they have made my role here enjoyable and even fun. Actually, I love those people. On behalf of the Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Goodbye. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongahela County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975, which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. Additional support for the law works is provided by the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.